Hello and welcome to MZ Webinars. Thank you so much for joining us. This is the second session we have in our webinar series, Rebuilding Your Local Economy After a Year of Disrupt Disruption. Our host today is MZ's Director of Economic Development, Will Cookson. If you have any questions during the course of the webinar, please put them in your questions box on the control panel and we'll endeavour to get back to them at the end of the presentation. You will be receiving a follow-up email with the recording and slides from today's presentation, so please keep your eyes open for that. So without any further ado, I'll hand over to you, Will. Thanks, Debbie, and uh, greetings to um, everyone that's joined us today. Um, so yes, as Debbie mentioned, this is the second in our series of three webinars, all themed around uh, rebuilding and recovery after the year of, and I'm going to say it now, unprecedented uh, disruption. So what we're going to do today is we're going to look specifically at how we can help you to identify local sector strengths. Now I'm just going to give a brief introduction to MZ for those that don't know us. Um, our mission is to help organisation individuals make better decisions relating to the world of work and employment. And we see skills as being absolutely central to helping uh, organisations and individuals understand this. Um, we do this through the provision of robust, detailed and localised labour market information, which is built into a proprietary data set. And we work with two distinct types of data. We have structural, um, LMI, which comes from official government sources, which we then model, and we have big data, which mainly comes in the form of job postings, which we scrape and deduplicate and extract the relevant information from, including the ways in which skills are described by employers. So what we're going to describe, uh, explore, I should say, today, um, as we all know, we've had a year of disruption. Um, we've been uh, tracking that. Um, over the last year and we continue to track that and what we will do today is we'll look um, a bit at how things are tracking but specifically in regards to industries for those that were with us last week for the first in this series we focus more on occupations so we're going to spin it slightly differently and um, we're also going to focus on how MZ Insight can be used to, un to understand and identify and quantify local sector strengths so um, just a quick uh, run through of what we're going to explore. We'll look at current labour market with a focus on industries. We'll look at practical ways in which our analyst tool can be used to identify local sector strengths. And we'll share details on how you can better understand your local economy. So how is the labour market tracking? So um, this is looking at um, job postings um, and it's going right the way back uh, to a pre pandemic on the left hand side. Um, and then you'll see really the story of last year. And this black line here is the pre um, pandemic uh, levels of recruitment demand that we'd expect to see across the UK economy. And you can see here what's really interesting as as we get just beyond and into April, um, you can see that we can really picked up. We can see that we're actually uh, firmly above that pre COVID period, which is great news. Um, obviously, that's looking right across the board across all uh, industries and occupations and recruitment activity as a whole. Um, but what's interesting is we, we um, if we look at if we look at uh, the breakdown by a single digit industry, uh, we start to see a slightly different picture. And this um, really look at what we're looking at here. The green uh, line is furlough as a percentage of the workforce, and the dark line are unique active job postings, and that's a percentage um, based on February 2020. Um, so what we're doing is we're looking back at that pre-pandemic pre um, level before lockdown one, and then we're seeing how recruitment demand has um, tracked. 
And you can see here, um, for example, over in accommodation and food services. Um, and you can also see if we look um, at other service activities and we can also see if we look at wholesale and retail we're almost back with accommodation and food services and retail to that pre-pandemic level of recruitment activity and we can also see the, the furlough data goes up to march and you can see really it's not it's going in the right trajectory um, the kind of exception would be um, arts entertainment and recreation where we can see furlough levels are still fairly high and although um, recruitment um, activity is picking up, still got a bit of a way to go. Um, and I think what we're seeing really is we're seeing recovery. Um, we're seeing that furlough has worked and been effective in terms of protecting jobs. Um, but obviously we still want to continue to track this and our customers continue to track this to see whether it is going to be a full recovery. And what we would expect to see as accommodation and food services and hospitality and recruitment, as those services start to be accessible um, and hopefully, fingers crossed, everything continues on the roadmap that's been set out, then we'd expect recruitment demand to actually go above a pre-COVID level because obviously that a lot of things have been put on hold um, and we're hoping to see uh, the uh, bounce back that is much talked about. So um, yeah, just to um, stay with industry data um, and looking at how it's tracking overall, the other way in which we can look at this is we can look at, um, and on the y-axis here, we've got the share of employment um, of um, people that have been furloughed. So we're seeing how many people, percentage of the workforce that have been furloughed based on March data. So a little bit old, but um, still useful indicator. Um, and then what we can see on the x-axis is the share of jobs lost year on year. So we're looking at jobs growth. Um, and what we can really see here is that actually right the way over there on the right hand side, those are there, they've been pretty unaffected um, in terms of recruitment activities carried on. And we can see also that um, furlough hasn't particularly um, impacted um, on the greater proportion of the workforce. Whereas if we get over onto the far left hand side, we can see two real outliers here, probably not a huge surprise. Accommodation and food service activities, these are single digit industries, so quite broad groupings, arts, entertainment and recreation. And those are the two that areas that we really need to focus in on. And we've got here in this midpoint, other service activities. We see admin, which came through when we looked at occupations uh, last last week, um, admin and secretarial roles. And then, um, yeah, and then everything else, I would say, is in a safer space. So that's a quick recap. And what we're looking at, I should say here, what we've looked at here is we've looked at analysis of the workforce job series. Um, and also HMRC statistics, and we've uh, analysed those. So. Without further ado, we're going to move on to look at our analyst tool and a yeah, slightly different focus to last week. What we're going to do is we're going to look specifically at how the tool can be used to help you understand sectoral strengths, employment patterns, uh, productivity. Uh, we'll look a bit at supply chain activity as well um, and different ways in which we can understand which industries are growing fastest and compare different markets and do some scenario planning using our input output model as well. So quite a lot to go through. Uh, like I said, a different focus to last week's, which was specifically looking more at job postings and how that maps against uh, occupations data. So we're going to start with uh, Sector Strength Finder. Now, this was something that was introduced um, through our collaboration and work with the local government sector um, and local authorities and specifically their economic development teams that wanted to really understand and unpick what makes their area comparatively different to the broader UK average. So there's a few things that we're looking at here and I'll describe it in some detail. So uh, Key thing to mention on the x-axis, what we're looking at is we're looking at location quotient. 
Um, and what that really means is if you see here at this midpoint of one, that would mean that any of these bubbles, which reflect a cluster or a sector, um, a cluster of industries making up a sector, um, any one of these um, will have a location quotient. And if it comes in at one, it means it's completely in line with the national average. So it means you've got the same proportion of that those industries that make up the sector in your area as you would expect to find across the UK. Um, anything from 1.2, which is where this grey line is, um, anything beyond that is quite significant. And it means you've got a higher proportion of these industries um, than you would expect to find. Now, the way in which we've grouped together the industries into clusters, um, essentially what we've done is we've looked at um, one, one completely uh, important thing to mention is we've looked at whether they're local or tradable. Um, local industry will essentially provide a product or service that is consumed locally. Um, and they will be large employers. Think of things like health and social care, um, education up to secondary, um, and think of um, also um, building, building of houses. Um, tradable industries are different. They will probably employ less people, but in terms of productivity, they're really important to your economy because they can export a service or product out of area, as well as it potentially being consumed in area. So they've got a wider market which they can service. Um, essentially, we're looking at uh, whether those industries employ people where their output is consumed. And if they do, they're local. If they don't, they're tradable. Tradable uh, clusters here are green and the local industries are grey. Um, how do we decide how to group those under, underpinning each of these uh, clusters of 560 industries at a four digit level? And um, what we do is we group those together depending on are they co-located? They tend to have employment in the same places. Are they using the same workforce? Do industries rely on the same sorts of occupations? Are they recruiting similar people into their workforce? And are they interacting within each other's supply chain? Are they buying and selling from one another? That would allow us to then define um, each of the 560 industries, group them together into 49 clusters, 14 of which are local industry clusters, and uh, the remaining um, 35 are tradable industry clusters, which are green. So um, the only final thing to mention is on this graph here, we're also looking across the period which has been set from 2016 to 2020 at national change. Are they growing or are they declining? And then we have four quadrants, um, three which are named, um, and essentially what we're looking at here is strengths and opportunities. Are they, do you, comparatively, do you have more of these clusters? um in your area and are they growing um, and then you'll have opportunities as well whether you know that these uh, sectors are growing because you uh, put in place certain interventions in order to bring it across over time to be a strength to grow that particular sector and there might be a good reason that you wouldn't be able to or there may be a fair uh, opportunity to do that risks in this bottom right quadrant are where those uh, industries or sectors are declining. So it might be that you have a higher proportion of these and over time they are declining. So what I thought would be useful would be to um, look at um, how we present each of these. As you hover a mouse over each one of these, and I should say we're looking at the Thames Valley Berkshire region here, um, as you ho um, hover over, you'll get certain metrics that you can look at. Uh, you'll find out what the location is, so the location quotient is, sorry, so almost um, getting on for four times the national average of the digital sector, the volume of jobs based on structural labour market information, um, the average wages, which are based on regional data, um, how um, national job growth is tracking over the time period that we've set over here, uh, GVA based on 2018, which goes down to uh, local authority level and percentage of total GVA. And you see how critical the digital sector is to Thames Valley Berkshire. Um, but there's other um, clusters that we might want to have a quick look at in terms of those high level metrics. Uh, food and beverage, which is a local industry, that hospitality industry, 
not as significant in terms of its location quotient, high volumes of jobs there, um, and still, you know, a fair percentage in terms of total uh, GVA. And then I'll have a quick look at another um, local industry, which is the health and care cluster, um, high volumes of jobs, more uh, location quotient again, under one, um, but we know also there's other factors involved in terms of health and care. We've got um, an aging demographic uh, and we know that there's going to be need for more health and care across the board. Um, and then you can see there as well in terms of GVA, quite significant in terms of its impact. Now, the digital sector is often um, closely associated with the creative cluster. Um, and you can see there on the far right hand side, we've got the digital sector and then we've got the creative cluster here. Not the same in terms of total job numbers, hence the size of the uh, size of the sector or the bubble is much more small. Uh, and then what we've got here is we've got location quotient of 1.7 pretty much. But yeah, you can see that there is a connection there between as we would expect to see between digital and creative. Then what we can do is if we jump in and have a look at any one of those clusters, and I've picked digital here, you'll see we have a summary and it starts to pick out some of the metrics we've already seen, the uh, total jobs, um, percentage against the national average, 266% above the national average in terms of the volume of jobs based on that 2020 data. We can bring in certain comparisons. Here we've included Reading which we know is a key driver um, for the digital sector across the Thames Valley Berkshire area. Uh, we've got average ages are there as well, and we've seen percentage change. So you can see actually the national picture is slightly catching up, uh, not to the extent in terms of the job volumes we can see here, but in terms of percentage change over this period, there's been more growth nationally than there has been in Thames Valley Berkshire. We can also identify uh, the top 10 occupations at a four digit level. So who is the cluster um, employing? Um, and you can see here, um, as you'd imagine, um, program and software development professionals making up almost 16% the total jobs within the sector, number of people employed there. Um, and then you can go through and you can see it goes down to market and sales directors. Um, obviously, there's a full staffing pattern that you can see within the analyst tool, but top 10 occupations is really good for understanding which occupations are key to the sector. We can also look at the supply chain um, within the area. So in region purchases will be the purchases that are made within Thames Valley Berkshire. So how well has a sector been served in area? by its supply chain. And this can provide um, ident or identify opportunities for um, further gains and further sector growth. Obviously, if you have a local supply chain that an employer can um, tap into, then that really helps with uh, business attraction and with building the sector um, and um, obviously realising the uh, opportunities that are there within the supply chain as well as the employers that are directly at the front end of the sector itself. Imported purchases, I should mention, will be anywhere outside of the defined area. So that could be international, could be Europe, or it could be elsewhere in the UK. And this is drawing on MZ's input output model, which we'll have a look at in a bit more detail later on. Now, um, the other thing that we can do um, underpinning each of the sectors, we identify the four digit industries that make up the sector. So these are all of the four digit industries, um, standard industry classifications. And what we've done here is we've identified six, um, six of them, which are the highest, you know, which have the highest volume of employment. And you'll see here, there's slightly different pictures here. Wireless telecoms activity is actually um, increased over the time period. Uh, computer consultancy activities also increase. Programming has dropped slightly. Uh, well, 17%, so you could argue significantly dropped over that time period. So what we are do, what we can see is when we get down to that granular level in terms of the industries, 
quite different pictures um, in regards to um, the total number of employment and how that's tracking over time. But if we select these six, then we can look at those in isolation as well. So we can quickly identify and analyze and do look at the same overview, but just looking at those six industries. And you'll see here we've put in comparisons for Reading, Slough, Woking, Windsor and Maidenhead. And you can see very different pictures there. Um, and you can see that Woking um, has the highest volume there. And actually uh, Reading, quite spiky, but you can see their percentage change over time. I just wanted to show that you can uh, obviously get from that high level view of what's happening sectorally right the way down to the granular level of uh, really digging into a specific industry. So that's our sector strength finder tool. Um, it's well established now. Um, it's been used by a large number of our customers to help quantify and understand comparatively what makes their area different, but also um, very important in the current climate for them to be able to identify sectors that they may really want to focus in on and may want to with the disruption that's taken place um, within the labour market may want to redirect people or upskill people in order to be able to work in that sector can also inform um, in inward investment or business and traction uh, activity or strategies um, Again, we're looking at Thames Valley Berkshire Let. This is a different report. So what this is we're doing here, and we've got the same time period to 2016 to 2020, looking at the fastest growing um, industries. And what we're interested in here um, really is looking at changing jobs um, and looking at the, the volume of employment as well. And you can see um, here we've got bar chart, which allows us to do comparisons. And um, there's far more detail that underpins this as well within the report itself. But it's another way of understanding, not just from a sectoral presence, but also from a industry growth um, perspective. Where are the job volumes going to be in terms of employment and how's that tracking over time? Market comparison is a different report. And what we've done here is we've put in the UK, we've put in the LEP, and then we've put in each of the local authorities that make up the LEP geography. And this will give us some regional metrics in terms of demographics, total employment, um, exports and imports using our input output model. And then um, specifically we could compare, and here we compare, can comparing information communication so staying with the uh, digital sector and we can see how jobs are changing the volume of jobs um, and the low amount of locations you can see actually the vast majority um, um, insufficient data here for the uh, payroll business locations we've also got jobs location quotient so we can see here that actually when we look at the information communication sector, um, you can see that comes through really strongly, almost three times the national average um, in across the LEP geography. And then it goes above that in both Reading, Wokingham and West Berkshire. Um, but yeah, pretty, pretty solid across um, three times the national average um, is something that's really strong. And we can do market comparisons on any uh, grouping of industries um, and any geography as well. So you can do um, comparisons internally or, for example, if you had an inward investment inquiry and you, um, you know that an employer is considering locating into a location in your area and potentially another area, then you can do a comparison of the two, which you can share with them. So a really useful report there. Um, the other thing, and I mentioned this earlier, we have an input output model. There's many ways in which this can be used. Um, it can, but one of the things that you can do is you can start to manage and look at some scenarios. So, for example, here what we've looked at is we've looked at a 10% decrease across food and beverage industries in the Greater Manchester Combined Authority area. Um, we're using um, the EMZ model to do this. Um, and essentially what it looks at is it looks at the impact that that will have in terms of jobs, in terms of wages, 
um, and then you can start to see the impact on particular um, underpinning industries as well and how that would be distributed um, and then you can see here the impact in terms of obviously accommodation and food service activities would bear the brunt of that but then it would also impact on retail as well and to some extent on manufacturing so it starts to take into account not just a primary impact on the industry that we've identified itself but also on the direct supply chain and the indirect supply chain and the broader impact that will have in terms of the money that's in the local economy so really what i hope you've gained from there is, is more of a focus as i said on terms of industries um, really trying to help um, our customers understand comparatively what makes their area different compared to the national average and the national picture and really help them understand sector strengths which then they can focus in on either by looking at what industries are driving those sector strengths um, or just looking at whether there are opportunities to further grow that through understanding opportunities that may sit there within the supply chain um, and to really try and make their area uh, really hospitable to a particular sector. We then also um, looked at fastest growing industries in terms of job volumes and then we also looked at how you compare different markets either internally and locally um, or more broadly comparing two particular areas. So um, yeah, our, our customers um, essentially are using this insight to help understand their comparative advantage um, and opportunity and to identify opportunities for further growth, inform their strategic planning in terms of their thinking about which sectors are important to them and how they may be able to further support the growth in those sectors, um, supporting inward investment and business attraction activity, and really bring an evidence base to support funding bids uh, and we know that um, there's going to be a significant amount of funding that's available um, in line with a recovery and we've seen some of that with the community renewal funds um, activity that's been taking place at the moment um, and then finally obviously and we come back to this point quite a lot they can target um, interventions and that might be okay we know that a particular sector is strong in our area um, and we understand the skills that sector is seeking through going back to what we looked at last week in terms of job posting activity and what skills are important to the sector and then starting to look at uh, collaborative projects maybe with um, the FE and HE sector to put in place provision that can allow uh, residents to upskill um, and retrain in order to be able to gain employment in those growth sectors. Now I'm just going to pause for breath and just see whether we've got any questions. Yeah, I think we have one question, Will. Um, will June 21st or missing the deadline impact on any sector other than arts and recreation? Well, June the 21st or missing the deadline impact on John, Yeah, is that okay? Yeah, it's fine. Good question. Um, I think there will. Um, arts and recreation, yes, um, it, it is obviously a sector that will be impacted if it, if it doesn't happen. I think more, there's, there's a fair few variables here. If we stay with things as they are here and today, then I imagine there'd be less impact. We, we know that um, we, we know that things have opened up significantly more than in a lockdown situation. If things start to regress and we end up going more towards a softer lockdown or a full lockdown, then yes, there will be significantly more impact. Um, let's assume um, for the sake of uh, the question that things remain as they are right now. Um, but June the 21st and the full opening up that's on the roadmap doesn't happen, then yes, I would assume that there would be a broader impact than just um, the arts and recreation. I think um, more broadly, there'd be an impact in regards to retail service industries 
and um, hospitality in the broadest sense. Um, but um, like I said, a lot of those um, businesses are able to trade at present. Um, and the real danger is that we start to go back into a lockdown situation. Um, interestingly, when we looked at the um, occupations last week um, and we looked at the recovery of construction, it does show that definitely uh, with certain sectors, they've really learned how to adapt and to work within a lockdown scenario. Um, but yeah, I would suggest that if things are remain as they are today, we'd still see a broader slowing down of recovery and obviously what we're expecting to see if things do progress in the way we all hope they do is we'd like to see recruitment levels actually go above what we saw right at the start of 2020 and we have started to see that in certain sectors and we'd imagine that obviously if things did open up we'd see that across the board because we know a lot of recruitment activity has been put on hold um, and for good reason I hope that answers the question um, do make contact if there are questions that you haven't been able to ask today and obviously if you are watching this um, at a later date um, do feel free to send through any questions that you may have um, i've got to say um, if you do want to um, have a look at your specific area obviously here we've used a couple of examples we've used thames valley Berkshire, greater manchester and, and also uk if you want to look at the insight that we've got for your area uh, you can book in a 30-minute session with myself uh, there are limited spaces available we had quite a lot of bookings a significant amount of bookings come in on the back of last year's last week's webinar and we've held back some for uh, this week um, so do um, book now if you would like to do that there's a link here um, but there will also be a link that will be shared in the follow-up email that will come um, across this afternoon um, a final webinar in this series next week looking very much at re-emerging demand the final webinar will highlight emerging trends um, including a look at growth in green jobs and um, green jobs is quite a tricky uh, area to quantify so we'll talk a bit about how we can use mz insight and data to do that um, and uh, yeah, it should be a really interesting webinar. So do, if you haven't already, register for that. Uh, do book a local consultation if that would be useful. And uh, thanks for your time today. Thank you and goodbye. Thank you.